All right, thank you everyone for dialing in and making time for this webinar. We had over 250 people register for this webinar, so we know there's a lot of interest in the topic. And before we go ahead and dive into the content, I wanted to just cover a few housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our C2ES YouTube page. And because we have so many participants, we'll go ahead and use the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Feel free to just type in your questions as the panelists are presenting, and then I'll raise them during our moderated discussion session. If for some reason we have technical difficulties and we lose connection, please feel free to just dial back in. And in terms of the agenda, I'm going to start us off by providing a quick intro to C2ES, and then I'll introduce our panelists. Then Drew Kojak will walk us through the vehicle standards. Professor John DeChico will provide us with some historical context on why these standards are important. And Deputy Commissioner Jared Snyder will share with us the view from New York. So he'll give us an update on what New York is doing in the EV space, and he'll explain to us how the California waiver fits in. And after that, we'll have time for an interactive discussion session. So now I'd like to just take a few moments and explain what C2ES is. We are an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization focused on climate change. And our core mission is to find practical solutions to do three things. We want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote clean energy, and boost resilience to climate impacts. And as you all probably know, the transportation sector is now the largest source of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. For today's webinar, we're really fortunate to have a great set of experts with us. Drew Kojak is the Executive Director of the International Council on Clean Transportation, which he founded in 2005. He is an internationally recognized expert on air pollution and transportation. Professor John DeChico is with the University of Michigan Energy Institute, and his research focuses on the transportation sector and climate change. So he's been looking at greenhouse gas emission standards, fuel economy standards, as well as biofuels development. And Deputy Commissioner Jared Snyder manages air resources, climate change, and energy for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. He is also the treasurer of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and he represents New York in the Transportation and Climate Initiative. So with that introduction, let me hand it over to Drew. Thank you so much, Fatima, and um, good afternoon, everybody uh, who's on the phone. Um, my job here today is to walk you through the basic regulatory landscape of state and federal emission standards uh, in the U.S., um, and there's about four of those. Uh, I will uh, put them in global context, um, and I will try to give you some sense uh, as to um, some technical information that we have that might bear on them. Um, so that's the quick intro. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide uh, which we keep updated at the ICCT uh, on a regular basis. Uh, it puts on one graphic um, all of the passenger vehicle fuel economy, greenhouse gas, CO2 standards that have been established around the world. There are now 10 countries or regions that have them, uh, representing about 85% of new passenger vehicles sold. A um, Couple things to note, uh, most importantly for the purposes of this discussion is to make the point that the US and Canada, that tends to follow the US, uh, really have set the global high water mark or the global level of ambition for passenger vehicle, CO2, fuel economy, greenhouse gas standards. Uh, those are the standards that go out to 2025. No other country or region in the world has standards that stretch out that far or that double uh, or more fuel economy for passenger vehicles. Um, so uh, in that respect, um, the US and Canada really are driving investment, uh, major reductions, uh, technology innovation uh, in the sector because of those standards. Um, coming hot on the heels of the United States, though, is Europe. Uh, you can see there's a, a more a dotted line uh, going out to 2030 now um, for EU in, 20, in 2030 at 76.3. 
uh, miles per gallon. That's the proposal. It may shift up or down when it's finalized at the end of this year, um, at which point Europe will now will then be the global uh, leader. But for many, many years, uh, the US um, and Canada have been. Um, last thing I'll say here, just for a general point, is that you can see that the slope of the lines have changed uh, significantly over time. Uh, if you look at the lines from 2000 to about 2010, uh, the annual rate of improvement was about one to two percent, maybe a little bit more than that, but not much. Uh, and since around you know 2015, let's say, the annual rate of improvement has really increased to about four to five percent annually, uh, and that has been an impressive also matching uh, with technology innovation that we've seen as well. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we get into one of the big topics for the day, which is the U.S. 2025 passenger vehicle greenhouse gas standards. Uh, this photo that I took um, back at the uh, Washington Convention Center uh, in 2011, uh, when all of the heads of the motor vehicle industry uh, were on stage with President Obama announcing uh, an agreement to go forward with the 2025 standards. Um, you can see lots of smiles there and lots of uh, collaboration. Um, and not only between the industry and uh, government, but also between government agencies. Government agencies at DOT, at EPA, and if you look at the left of the screen, you see Mary Nichols shaking President Obama's hand, so California also at the table. Um, so that's something that um, you know a lot of the players that have been working in this field for a long time are able to do. Um, and typically ends up uh, with better regulations and better policy because of it. Next slide. So here's our first uh, summary of um, one of the major regulations in play. This is again, the light duty passenger vehicle standards. Uh, and I give you a timeline of major events uh, to try to give you a sense of what's happening here. Um, in July of 2012, EPA and DOT finalized the light duty greenhouse gas and fuel economy standards. Importantly, they are on different time frames. The US EPA greenhouse gas standards going all the way out to 2025, as is allowed under the Clean Air Act. The fuel economy standards stopping in 2021 uh, because the underlying statute limits the agency's ability uh, to set standards for no more than five years. One of the main requests from the manufacturers at the time was that given the length and the long lead time of the standards that there would be a uh, midterm evaluation. Uh, and that was done starting in 2016 with the draft technical assessment report that summarized where this pace of technology was. <clears throat> um, and that was put out at that time. That was followed afterwards by a proposed and then a final determination by the US EPA, <clears throat> finding that based on all of that record, the standards, uh, the automakers could make the standards at lower cost than expected. In April, so earlier uh, this month, in 2018 now, EPA reversed that decision, um, or at least telegraphed, no, it did, it, sorry, it reversed that decision and telegraphed that it would be putting out a new proposal because it found that the standards are no longer appropriate and should be revised. And in that same document, there were eight factors that were identified. These are the types of factors that agencies go through uh, when they do a regulation, um, the availability, cost, and effectiveness of technology, impacts on emissions, oil security, consumer savings, impacts on the industry and safety, to name, name a few. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, both consumer acceptance and cost and availability in, in a couple of slides further. And then finally, what do we, so, so next steps, uh, we do expect that EPA and, and DOT will come out with a joint proposal to revise the standards sometime uh, in the next several months. Next slide. So I mentioned that California was also uh, a player in this. Uh, I, this is, a, I suspect, a very sophisticated audience. Uh, so I suspect you all know that California has independent authority under the Clean Air Act to set its own standards. Uh, as long as those standards meet certain criteria and the EPA approves them in a waiver. Um, but it's useful to remember that California really started uh, quite early in, 20, uh, in 2002 with legislation, followed up by uh, a regulation in 2004, 
Uh, and then there was a waiver petition in 2008, which was first denied under the Bush administration and then later granted under the Obama administration in 2009. So that's important to remember. Uh, and then in 2012, as a part of the grand agreement uh, that you saw earlier in the big photograph at the Washington Convention Center, California agreed to accept as an alternative compliance method um, automakers that uh, complied with the national EPA standards. Um, in March of 2017, uh, California also reacting to the technical assessment uh, report and all of the record of um, uh, technology improvement, et cetera, that had been done, uh, found that the standards were, um, uh, the evidence supported the standards as, as being adequate. Uh, the evidence was definitive and conclusive and there are no warrant, their adjustments were not warranted. At the same hearing, the agency recognized that it's deemed to comply provisions uh, were affirmed, uh, but cautioned that if the federal greenhouse gas standards were substantially changed, accepting compliance with the national program would likely be different. So that sets the stage there in California. Next slide. So here's some work that the ICCT has done. Um, we use the same types of models uh, and the same types of projections that are done uh, by any of the regulatory agencies that work on these standards, uh, not only in the US, but also internationally in Europe and China, et cetera. Um, and so we use simulation modeling to sort out uh, what level of technology is needed to meet certain standards and then what the costs are. Uh, and we, we, we use firms that are similar to the ones that other agencies uh, use to, to tear down different technologies and then cost them back up piece by piece. Uh, and what we found that over the course of the last several years, from 2012, uh, when EPA and, and DOT started, the expectation was that the average incremental cost uh, of a new passenger vehicle in 2025 would be about $1,800. Uh, fast forward um, to the TAR, uh, and EPA's assessment came down to $1,300. Again, in 2025, and our assessment following that um, based on uh, lots of assessments that we've done with suppliers uh, of technology costs and, and effectiveness, uh, drop that down to below $900 on average. Right? And there you have a graphic showing how those costs have come down. Next slide. Also relevant uh, to this upcoming rulemaking that we're expecting uh, is whether or not the consumers are accepting technologies and how the manufacturers are doing at complying. Uh, and are likely to be able to comply with the 2025 standards. And here you see actual vehicle models um, and the, the fuel economy that they have achieved. Um, and essentially what this shows is how manufacturers comply with a fleet average is that when they do retool uh, a particular model, uh, and that happens about once every five years, that they tend to put a lot of technology on that model uh, to leapfrog forward. And then that allows them to gather a lot of credits and, and offset some of the models that they haven't yet upgraded. And so that happened with the Toyota Camry most recently. There were eight different technologies that were on that uh, Camry, and that uh, brought the Camry up a little bit above the standards in 2022. Uh, and importantly, uh, Toyota did not rely on any hybridization, uh, not even stop start. There was no weight reduction and off cycle credits were not included here either. Uh, and so if you include all those things, our expectation is that the Camry even today uh, could meet the 2025 standards. And that doesn't mean that every vehicle could, uh, but we're, you're in 2018, we're, we're, we're you know, seven years away from 2025. It, it's a good indication of uh, the potential for manufacturers to achieve the standards. Next slide. So now uh, we're moving from the world of light duty vehicles uh, to heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and here uh, regulations globally are um, a little farther behind. There are only five uh, countries that have adopted some form of heavy duty vehicle standards. Japan actually started the world off in 2005 and their standards ran to 2015. Um, and then uh, followed uh, by the US and Canada uh, and then China and eventually and more recently India. 
Um, this is uh, just the tractor trailer section or segment of the fleet, so it's not the full heavy duty fleet. It would also include, let's say, delivery trucks or one ton pickups. But just for the tractor trailers, if you look at the bottom sort of grayish line here uh, that says US and Canada tractor plus trailer, you see that it's achieving more than a 50% reduction. So um, I'd like to bring everyone's attention to the fact that we get a lot of play in saying that we're going to double fuel economy for passenger vehicles in this country. Um, but it's notable also that when you look at tractor trailers, and that is the major segment of heavy duties that consume oil and generate greenhouse gases, uh, we're essentially also doubling that, or we would uh, if the standards remain in effect uh, by 2027. So that's when those standards go out to 2027. And again, hitting the global high water mark and driving technology and innovation and investment, et cetera. Um, you can also see lastly that the gap between tractor trailers and just the tractor, so eliminated the trailer, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, cuts the reductions by about 10%, so not insignificant. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, lastly, Europe's not on this. Uh, Europe is expected to come out with its proposal for CO2 standards for heavy duty uh, next month. Uh, I think the actual date is May 16th. Uh, and those standards are expected to run to 2030. So again, Europe, Europe would uh, push the envelope a little bit uh, once those standards come out and are finalized. Next slide. So we're uh, down to two uh, provisions of the heavy duty vehicle greenhouse gas rule uh, that I'll be uh, focused on. Uh, the first one is the trailer provision, right? And you just saw the importance of the trailer provision in the last slide. Um, the truck trailer manufacturers petitioned the EPA uh, to uh, essentially vacate that portion of the rule, arguing that the EPA simply didn't have authority, that the trailers are not self-propelled and they're thus not motor vehicles. Uh, and a judge has actually granted uh, that stay, uh, finding irreparable harm to the industry as potential uh, if it wasn't granted. Um, there are a couple interesting wrinkles to this one. Uh, the first is that DOT has a different statutory authority uh, for regulating trailers, and it it seems to um, uh, you know it, it 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 seems to be quite uh, credible, let's say, um, and different at any rate. Uh, and so the DOT trailer regulations remain in place for now, um, and that is because the they didn't reach to this irreparable harm problem because they don't go into effect in 2018. I think they go into effect in 2021. And then finally, interesting, another wrinkle is that if EPA uh, doesn't have authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate trailers, that may leave the field open to California or, or, or other states. Next slide. Um, and so the last regulation I'll talk about is the glider rule. And this is a relatively obscure part of, again, the same phase two heavy duty vehicle greenhouse gas standards that EPA promulgated in 2016. Um, it's interesting and notable, and I'll get to this in a second as to why, that after the rule was promulgated in 2016, that in uh, December of that year, uh, there were a number of petitions from states and local governments and a couple other organizations uh, petitioning the agency to work more on lowering NOx emissions from heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and EPA at the time acknowledged that peti those petitions and acknowledged the need for further NOx reductions. In November of 2017, uh, there was a proposal to repeal the sales cap on glider trucks. And a rule proposal is expected to be sent to OMB shortly um, to go final, because uh, it has been proposed already. Um, what are gliders? They are manufactured engines used in a glider is a, a word for just a, a heavy duty vehicle without an engine. Um, and those engines are, are typically what we call pre-emissions built in the 1990s, early 2000s, before strict emission limits. Um, the industry has grown fairly substantially. We, we don't have great numbers, but our best estimate is around 10,000 units. Uh, are now the annual sale of gliders, about 5% of class seven and eight tractor trailers or tractor sales. Uh, the surge largely driven, not entirely driven to avoid emission controls. Uh, and the provision affects not only greenhouse gas emissions, but will also affect the, you know, regular emissions like NOx. So next slide, please. 
So we did our best to try to give some sense of the scale and magnitude of the impacts. We only look at NOx emissions. We could do the same thing for fine particle emissions. We could do the same thing for greenhouse gas emissions, for example. Um, but to give you a sense of the scale, we're currently on a trajectory that's the blue line in the middle here that's maintaining the phase two sales cap. And you can see some significant reductions off of the baseline in terms of NOx from class seven and eight tractors sold after 2010. Um, and then if you wanted to go even further uh, and put additional controls, you could see some additional reductions from the baseline, which I'm going to call the blue line in the middle there, uh, to lower it even further. Um, but what we're looking at currently is neither one of those, uh, but really the trajectory that goes at the top line that ends in purple, and that's glider sales tripling by 2030. Given current increases, that seems not all that unreasonable. Uh, and we use a variety of emission factors from what's called the MOVES model, et cetera. Um, and you can see roughly that you're almost doubling NOx emissions from uh, 2030 at around, what, 350,000 uh, tons per year under the phase two rule with the existing cap going up to more than 600. So a substantial uh, change in the emissions profile of the industry. Um, and certainly something that would then put uh, manufacturers that are complying with the standards at an economic disadvantage if they're competing with trucks that don't have to comply with either the greenhouse gas or the, or the more stringent emission standards. So that's it for me for now. Um, I'll turn it back over to Fatima, um, and I look forward to a discussion uh, later on. Thank you, Drew. Now I'll hand it over to Professor John DiCicco. Thanks uh, very much. Uh Fatima, um, and thanks, Drew, for that uh, great overview uh, of the regulatory landscape. I'm going to step back a bit, uh, as well as offer what I hope will be some helpful ways of thinking, not only about the technology and cost considerations, but the market challenges uh, that are one of the things uh, we face, uh, you know, the reason given, an important part of the reason given by the auto industry for wanting to uh, weaken uh, the standards. So on this next slide, I'm going to, you know, just give my key points uh, about which I'll elaborate uh, as we go on. First of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is a real conflict between consumers' car buying instincts and the policy goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's a chronic problem, and it's one that needs to be confronted, but uh, we shouldn't be confronting it by gutting the regulations. Uh, ample technology is available to cut emissions, but it's as much a matter of how the technology gets used as whether or not it gets used. It is getting used. So we can't expect technological progress alone, uh, even much greater cost reduction for electric vehicles to bail us out of the predicament we find ourselves in right now. I'm also gonna talk a bit about cost issues, not so much a detailed cost analysis, which Drew uh, summarized on some of the cost curves he showed, but really um, more how to think about it. Um, <clears throat> there's been exhaustive studies of the issue, both by EPA, uh, the work by ICCT that that Drew recently did, and, and my own work, uh, my own reputation in this area was built over you know, 20 years of doing engineering economic analysis of the potential to improve uh, vehicle efficiency. I think it's clear that the costs are low, and more importantly, that they can be managed within automakers' normal product development budgets. It doesn't bust the budget in spite of um, some of the rhetoric that might come from the industry that it's not affordable to do things misaligned with consumer interest. And this you know, brings me to another point I'm gonna make that it's important not to confuse cost and price. And if you do that and have inflated cost estimates, that is then what leads to some of these false impressions uh, that the standards are gonna be creating adverse trade-offs like job loss and, and other issues like that. So I think it's important going forward to, you know, what I would say a declutter the debate and focus clearly on the need for steady carbon cutting progress 
uh, in ways that are in fact cost effective. So uh, on the next slide, I want to go back a little deeper in time uh, in, in, on the history of this issue. Uh, Drew started the clock when you know the standards, this current generation of standards were promulgated um, six or so years ago. But what we're really dealing with here is an issue and a regulatory framework that dates from uh, the first oil crisis. Uh, that's when the original CAFE standards were set, and they called for a doubling of fuel economy over 10 years. But even uh, within a few years, and even when prices were still relatively high, uh, complacency set in almost right away. Uh, even before the oil price crash, Ford and General Motors were calling for a CAFE rollback uh, under the Reagan administration, and of course, uh, the Reagan administration granted that rollback. We then went for a lot of years without much progress on this issue, and you know we're unfortunately dealing with a situation where federally, um, the environmental rationale is not as persuasive as it really needs to be. We can look back, um, you know, say it was 1988 when uh, Jim Hansen of NASA sounded the warning in his Senate testimony that global warming was real, it was here, a, a serious risk. Al Gore, uh, then in the Senate, introduced measures to raise CAFE as part of the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, but uh, that was blocked. Uh, during the first Gulf War, other efforts such as the Bryan Bill to increase fuel economy by 40% were also blocked. And then when uh, Clinton came in, he basically dodged uh, on the issue in spite of campaign promises to try to raise uh, fuel economy. So the country didn't get a wake-up call then until really 9-11, which brought home uh, in a tragic way, um, you know, some of the risks associated with oil dependence and then what was then still a very high dependence on the Middle East. So the rationale that got things unstuck initially uh, was energy independence. Uh, name of the ISO, the bill in 2007. Uh, George Bush in January 2007 got up and called for up to a 40% increase in fuel economy standards. Uh, and, and that then essentially became law in, in a bipartisan bill, 86 to 8, ISA passed <laughs> and had stronger CAFE in it. But by then, California was well on the way uh, to moving forward on greenhouse gas standards. As, as, as Drew pointed out, uh, the Pavley bill was passed in 2002 and they began promulgating standards shortly thereafter. We had the Massachusetts versus EPA Supreme Court decision uh, earlier in 2007. Uh, that enabled, you know, essentially, uh, so, you know, solidified the fact that EPA could regulate greenhouse gases uh, under the Clean Air Act. Uh, that did not, uh, that, that created an administrative opening that was then um, solidified with the Joint National Program put together by Obama that brought us the standards that uh, are on the table and being debated today. But it didn't deal with the lack of federal consensus on climate, and neither did it deal with the market interest problem uh, that I talked about before. So here we are again, uh, somewhat like things were 30 years ago, where we had a program for strengthening standards in place uh, and political forces uh, called for by moderated oil prices uh, are, have resulted in um, you know, efforts to weaken uh, the standards. So if we go to the next slide now, just a brief uh, sort of more tangible look at technology. I, I, um, I wanted to, you know, Drew showed uh, curves with cars, you know, passenger cars. Uh, a lot of the market has shifted to trucks, so I really, I you know, just want to emphasize, not numerically, but just in sort of tangible way with these uh, photos here on this slide that I conveniently clipped 
from last month's issue of Automotive Engineering Magazine, which had a feature entitled Truck Tech War, that talked about what the automakers, in particular Ford, General Motors, and Ram, Ram is the now the brand of um, Fiat Chrysler, a uh, pickups brand, uh, and how much technology they're putting into their redesigned pickups, ranging from better aerodynamics on that Silverado there. Uh, it was, it's been a few years now that Ford released a redesigned F-150 with an aluminum body and a turbocharged engine. And then the new Ram, uh, model year 19 Ram coming out is going to use more high strength steel to trim weight. And it will also feature a 48 volt um, mild hybrid among other efficient technologies. All of these technologies are available, feasible. The engineers are putting them into play and they are on track to achieving the kinds of targets that are already on the books. Next slide, I want to take um, also a big picture look at the cost issues. What I've done here, these cost numbers, first of all, these are bigger than like the under $1,000 ICCT estimate that Drew just showed or the roughly $1,000 recent EPA estimates, because these are the cumulative costs of the program, of the 15-year program uh, that we're you know, re really not even quite midstream into now. And I like to think about these costs as the incremental cost per year. So um, if we went back to uh, you know, what is the green bar, the uh, early, the 2010 TAR technology assessment report uh, from EPA, uh, that had a um, $3,100 price tag in it, that would have implied to reach that 54 and a half mile per gallon nominal fleet target in 2025, an incremental cost of $210 per year. And then we had some other uh, cost est estimates there, some lower cost, DCG, Boston Consulting Group study. My study, which didn't benefit from the depth of more recent technology the EPA did, I called my Horizons model, had a slightly higher cost even. The outlier here is the Center for Automotive Research, which at the time claimed $6,800. That's a uh, think tank out here in Ann Arbor, close to the auto industry. Now they've not done quite another study like that, but last year they released an analysis uh, in which they examined ranges of costs of $2,000, $4,000, and $6,000. And on the basis of those costs, particularly the higher ones, um, did economic analysis suggesting very adverse effects to the industry, suggesting job loss. And my point here is that those numbers are kind of really out of line, those kind of high cost numbers uh, on which these claims of job loss we hear about hinge are really out of line with um, you know, the reality of what it costs to improve efficiency. If we go to the most recent TAR, and that's the uh, few lines of text at the bottom of this slide, and just look at this last program, the one that's now under debate, last five years of the overall program, uh, or really last four years from 2021 to 25, um, the annual incremental cost is only still $230 a year. And that's the way I like to think of it because $230, I mean, that's a minor option choice on a vehicle. And the point is, is that these costs are the kinds of costs that can be easily and routinely absorbed during routine model design, along with all the other features that car companies are throwing in the mix. That brings me to the next slide, which is to emphasize that cost is not the same as price, kind of a basic Econ 101 um, concept Price is a market outcome influenced by numerous factors, uh, larger macroeconomic forces on vehicle sales, issues related to competition, terms of trade, overcapacity, uh, productivity works to hold down costs. And in reality, automakers have a limited ability to pass costs on to consumers. That works to consumers' advantage. It means that the cost estimates that we see, even say that $230 per year, doesn't mean that it's gonna be necessarily reflected in the price. 
And for that reason, there's no sound basis in particular for projecting job impacts one way or the other and other adverse impacts uh, related to higher vehicle prices uh, alleged on, on the basis of regulation. And you know, consumers get this. Over many years, many years of polling, there's consistently strong support for higher fuel economy standards because it has been a very good deal for consumers. Automakers invest and consumers save. I completely understand why automakers don't like to be regulated because those particular costs are difficult to pass on to consumers. They would rather use, say, that extra $230 a year to put in some nice additional creature comfort or an upgrade in a nav system or a sound system that customers will value at $230 a year. Uh, and it sticks in their craw to have to spend money to re-engineer for efficiency when consumers aren't interested. But that's the very reason why we need to have regulation uh, to balance out these social issues against just what is otherwise laissez-faire. Now, on uh, turning to my next slide, that just you know really brings me back to this point that I kind of want to leave everyone with, and and that is we really need to confront uh, the problem of weak consumer interest. Uh, it was a foreseeable problem, um, but how can we approach it in a way that doesn't involve abandoning our goals, our necessary goals for CO2 reduction? I think we really need to begin thinking about a serious, durable effort to educate, inform, and empower consumers to make greener choices across all segments of the car market. We can't just narrowly focus on plug-in cars and other alternative fuels but we really need to find ways to convey a message that anyone can make a difference by simply choosing the most efficient vehicle that meets their needs and fits their budget. Remember, technologically speaking, we don't need electrics to meet those 2025 targets. We'll be seeing more of them as their cost comes down, but they're not where the action is, they're not where the urgent need is, and they're not where the problem is uh, in terms of market interest which is in all the mainstream segments, like those trucks. So <clears throat> the situation we're in should really come as no surprise, um, the way I look at it. It's, it's an unhappy situation, it's being politically exploited, but it was also foreseeable in many ways. Greenhouse gas emissions need to be progressively and continually cut, but we can't expect, and nor should we want, fuel prices to continually rise. Um, I think it was 20 years ago in the 90s when I was working on this issue, we were in a similar low price situation. I, I first said that fuel prices are a fickle friend when it comes to the need to protect the environment. Uh, it was around that time when I was at ACEEE, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, that we developed the Green Book, which ACEEE continues to publish online at greenercars.org. But that's just one small effort, uh, and the scale and reach of programs needed to better connect the dots between individual consumers' environmental values, which we know they have, and the choices made in the showroom. Uh, that kind of effort to connect those dots needs to be uh, much broader. And so I think we need to make some investments in that. It's not going to bail us out of the crisis we have today. But I, I do want to, even though I certainly disagree with the effort to weaken regulation, uh, acknowledge that in some sense the auto industry has a, a real concern on its hand when the regulatory signal gets out of line with consumer interests and we're not really doing anything to address those consumer interests. So I'll uh, leave it right there. The last slide. Um, of mine just has some links to some, you know, additional information, some additional pieces I've done uh, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that presentation. That was very helpful to have that historical context. And now I'd like to hand it over to Deputy Commissioner Jared Snyder. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Um, could you uh, go to the next slide, please?
So I, I'm going to touch on a, a few points um, today. First of all, I'm, I want to um, talk about the importance of reducing transportation emissions, uh, particularly in New York, but I think it, it reflects importance across across the country and, and in several other states. Um, talk a little bit about the regulatory framework in New York. We heard about the California standards, um, and I'm going to talk about how states can adopt the st- the California standards to to continue to drive uh, progress in in the states. Um, and then I'm, one one part of that I'm going to talk about is the the zero emission vehicle mandate that California adopted and New York has opted into. And then I'm going to talk about three other uh, programs that that support um, emission reduction from transportation um, that that New York's involved in. One is the the ZEV MOU action plan, uh, which supports the ZEV mandate. Second, the opportunity um, uh, that, that is provided by the, the Volkswagen settlement. And then third, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, an initiative that, that uh, New York and, and several other states in the Northeast are working on. Uh, next slide, please, Fatima. So um, first, I I just want to touch on the challenge of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions generally, and and particularly from the transportation sector. You know, what you see here is New York's greenhouse gas emissions um, in 1990 and and 2014. Um, That that the green bar shows overall emissions. They have gone down, uh, but that's largely driven by the power sector. You can see that blue bar shows that power sector emissions have, have really been pretty much cut in half in that time period, while transportation emissions have actually gone up. Now, now most of that increase in transportation emissions was was before around 2010. Um, emissions have been been you know relatively flat since then, but we really need to turn that curve downward. Um, uh, next slide, please, Fatima. And so this shows what New York's goals are, and it shows really the importance of of reducing the transportation emissions. We cannot achieve those reduction targets, 40% reduction from 20 or from 1990 levels by 2030 and 80% by 2050. We can't achieve those without reducing emissions from the transportation sector. In fact, that that you know. 2050 target is well below the transportation emissions in the state currently. Even if we eliminated all power sector emissions, all emissions from buildings, transportation emissions still need to go down. So that's just to provide the context for some of what we're doing in in New York and the Northeast. Um, Next slide, please. So, um, you know, both both Drew and and John spoke about the, the California um, emission standards. Um, Under Section 177 of the Clean Air Act, um, other states can adopt the California emission standards. And New York has consistently done that for passenger vehicles. Um, We we adopted the the low emission vehicle program in 1992. Um, In 2002, we adopted California's zero emission vehicle program. We adopted the greenhouse gas emission standards in in 2005. Uh, Twelve other states uh, adopt um, all or or some part of the California um, emission standards and that that zero emission vehicle mandate, um, nine other states um, have adopted that. So um, the the California standards um, that were in place before the, the 2011 um, um, federal uh, program was slightly more um, slightly more stringent than the federal standards, and and you know for for a number of detail reasons, it's re- really not particularly relevant. Um, but but they do it ach- would achieve slightly more emission reductions. But when as part of that agreement that that um, that, that that took place in 2011. Um, California agreed that compliance with the federal standards would comply with the California standards. And so um, New York has adopted that provision in, in our regulations as well. So now we, we, you know, recently EPA announced its plan to roll back the 22 
to 2025 standards. Um, we are strongly opposed to that. Uh, Governor Cuomo has said that New York will work with California and other states to preserve our own greenhouse gas emission standards because of the importance of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, in that, that um, opposition to the, the federal rollback, we're also um, joined by the other members of the U.S. Climate Alliance. The, the U.S. Climate Alliance is 16 states and Puerto Rico that are committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, committing to complying with the Paris Accord, uh, represent over 40% of the population of the United States, um, would be the, the third largest economy in the world. And so this is a, an important group of states that is united in opposition to weakening the federal standards. Uh, Fatima, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a bit about the, the, the zero emission vehicle mandate, which can be achieved by selling um, electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and, and fuel cell vehicles um, in California, New York, and the other eight states that have adopted it. Um, now, John made the point that, um, that, that, that electric vehicles are not needed to meet the 2025 standards. And, um, you know, while, 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 that is, while that is true, they are going to be needed to meet the, the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals that, that the states have set based on science that scientists are telling us are needed for 2030 and 2050. We're not going to achieve that 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions without zero emission vehicle cars that are plugged into the electricity grid either directly as electric vehicles are indirectly running on, on hydrogen that is produced by a, a near zero emission vehicle electric grid. And in New York and, and the other states that have adopted the, the zero emission vehicle mandate, there, there's really um, a, a correspondence with what we are doing on the power sector. We're greatly reducing emissions from the power sector um, that New York has a goal of 50% renewable energy by 2030, for, exa for example. And so we're plugging in the electric vehicles into that increasingly low carbon grid. And that is, that's really the vision for the future, how we achieve the greenhouse gas reductions that are needed. So um, in 2018, some significant changes come into effect in the zero emission vehicle program in New York and the other states that have adopted the California mandate. Um, that, that, as you can see from the graph, the, the, the um, sales mandate starts increasing significantly, um, up to over 22% of, of vehicles by 2025 must be um, electric vehicles of some form. Um, and uh, of those, um, and, and, and the difference between the, the gray and the, 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 the rust color bar really relates to how many can be plug-in hybrid as opposed to, to full zero emission vehicles. The exact number of vehicles that that, um, that would translate to it, we estimate approximately 800,000 electric vehicles in New York by 2025, but the exact number could depend on the mix between um, full electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, and fuel cell vehicles, because each type of vehicle gets different level of credit under the mandate. Until 2018, um, manufacturers could meet the, the ZEV mandate in New York and another other northeastern states by what's known as travel, um, and and what 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 that is is basically they could comply through the sale of vehicles in California. Um, that is no longer the case starting in in 2018. Um, there is an option to pool sales among the northeastern states, but 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 starting this year, um, sales in California um, no longer would would suffice. And also starting this year, um, the sale of conventional hybrids do not provide credit under the, the um, ZEV mandate. 
So uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, going to another point that, that John made of that, that disconnect between, um, you know, consumer interest and the technology, we, we, we recognize that it is essential to support consumer interest in, in zero emission vehicles and electric vehicles. And so, so um, most of the states that have the ZEV mandate agreed in 2013 to an MOU under which we were going to collaborate on a number of programs that would build consumer interest in electric vehicles. That's things like um, incentives, consumer incentives, support for electric vehicle infrastructure, um, things like special access to high occupancy vehicle lanes, um, making it easy to identify where to charge vehicles. And we're working together on all of those strategies to 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 give consumers a, a very satisfactory um, experience with electric vehicles. Um, in New York, we have a number of incentives that that align with that that um, MOU and the action plan that was developed under it. Uh, we provide point of sale rebates up to two thousand dollars for for uh, zero emission vehicles. That's on top of the the federal. Um, tax credit. Um, we provide, we have a municipal uh, rebate program, which is important because municipalities um, are not eligible for the tax rebates. And so um, this, this basically gives municipalities an incentive to buy electric vehicles. Uh, high occupancy vehicle lane access, um, tax credits for um, uh, charging um, infrastructure are also among the, the um, incentives that we provide. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the governor has set a goal of significantly increasing uh, charging infrastructure in New York. Right now, we have about 2,000 publicly available um, charging ports in New York State. Uh, the goal is to increase that to 10,000 by 2021, basically a five-fold increase. And um, a number of utility programs are also supporting um, electric vehicle infrastructure and electric vehicle sales. And finally, we're working with the manufacturers and dealerships on a number of strategies to build a successful and sustainable um, market for plug-in electric vehicles. And, and that has a, a consumer education element to it. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to show this slide, which, which really illustrates the um, the the building out of charging infrastructure in the 177 states um, compared to California. Now, California is ahead of us. They've had this mandate in place with teeth um, since 2012. Well, as I said, it doesn't have teeth in the Northeast until this year, 2018. Uh, but then when you look at the number of, of charging stations we have in place in, in the 177 states now compared to what California had in 2012, um, we're, we're really far ahead. And we have um, twice as many outlets per vehicle in, um, in the, the 170 states than, than is currently the case in California. California has a lot more charging stations, but, but many more electric vehicles because the mandate has had teeth um, until this point. And so and that, that's, that's including the, the 2,000 charging stations we have in, in New York um, now. As I said, we're, we have a goal of increasing that to 10,000, which is supporting the much steeper um, electric vehicle sales mandate in the coming years. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to touch on, just for a moment, the opportunity posed by the, the Volkswagen settlement. Um, the, the Volkswagen settlement provided $2.9 billion nationwide for um, mitigating the impacts of the, the VW violations. Uh, New York gets $127 million from that, and we are developing a plan for investing um, that based on um, you know, significant public outreach um, 
six, over 60 meetings we've held, um, uh, close to 200 public comments. And, and all those are, are really um, leading us in, in a direction of, of um, sort of using this opportunity to support clean electric transportation. So, so, you know, an emphasis on, to the extent possible, replacing diesel vehicles with electric vehicles um, to the extent that, that we can do that with with the funding provided. Um, also consistent with the, the goals of the settlement, we're gonna be focusing emission reductions in, in non-attainment areas and, and also um, being sure that we benefit the, the, the communities that have borne a disproportionate burden of, of diesel emissions. Um, so, you know, this is an opportunity to really, you know, jumpstart electrification of that heavy duty um, element, trucks and buses. Uh, next slide, please. Another program I, I wanted to talk about for a moment that also um, supports the, the reduction of emissions from the transportation sector is the, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is an alliance of, of Northeastern Mid-Atlantic states um, to reduce, to collaborate on strategies to reduce carbon emissions from the transportation sector. It, it sort of was built out of the, the REGI program um, that have been in place since um, about 2007, uh, we decided in 2010 to sort of take the lessons learned there and, and, and apply some of it to the transportation sector. So um, the Northeastern states, um, their, their transportation officials, energy officials, and environmental officials have collaborated on a number of strategies, some focused on freight, some focused on electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, in 2017, um, eight of the states, including New York, announced that they were going to be beginning a, a year-long process of, of undertaking public listening sessions to, to get ideas for, for comprehensive for a comprehensive program to reduce transportation emissions. Um, and, and the goal is to, to, at the same time, you know, we have this opportunity to, to modernize the transportation system, reduce congestion, reduce transportation emissions, and, and, and achieve other social and economic goals similar to what we've done it, with Reggie of, of creating jobs, supporting innovation, uh, providing public health benefits. And, and so we're, we're engaged in that process. We, um, we've had a listening session in Albany. There's ones coming up in Hartford and Wilmington. Uh, there will be others um, that, that will, will sort of get ideas from the public that, that we can evaluate and, and uh, you know, put into practice. Um, New York has a has a complementary effort um, of of developing a comprehensive strategy for New York State, and which we are working with our counterpart transportation environmental agencies on. Uh, next slide, please. And here I just wanted to touch on some of the ideas that we've heard from stakeholders. Um, many, many stakeholders have been recommending a cap and invest program like REGI or other carbon pricing mechanisms. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, electrification. Um, some stakeholders have been recommending congestion pricing, which could, could be sort of a standalone policy or could be complementary to a, a carbon pricing strategy. And you know, other pro, other ideas mentioned vehicle miles, traveled fees, um, incentive programs to to provide incentives for electric buses, electric school buses, um, things like that. And uh, and so you know, one of the questions is connecting some of those ideas for incentive programs with a comprehensive program that, that you know, might provide the revenues to fund the incentive programs. Um, another thing we hear a lot is, is sort of a focus on equity, you know, making sure that, that all of our people in, the, in the, the, our states are able to benefit from this program and predictability. It's important to have a policy mechanism that is predictable and that, that can then uh, drive innovation. So um, I think that's an, all I have for now, and I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you, Dara. That was very informative, and it's great to see New York taking such a leadership position. So for the folks who are listening to the webinar, please feel free to go ahead and type in your questions. I know many of you have been doing so. I'm going to kick us off with a couple of questions, and then we'll turn to the ones from the audience. So my first question, I actually want to start by asking Drew, you know, we've heard about how there are both greenhouse gas emissions from EPA as well as fuel economy NHTSA. And, you know, from your perspective, do you feel like these are duplicative? Could one do the job of the other? Well, hi. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Fatima. And this is a question which has actually uh, been raised to me um, actually from the auto industry as well uh, that would like to see a simplified program uh, that doesn't have both. Um, uh, you know, there is some differences between the two programs, to state the obvious. Uh, the EPA program under the Clean Air Act uh, goes beyond CO2 and includes uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, from primarily from uh, low GWP refrigerants uh, and air conditioners. So there's an important wrinkle there. Um, I think, uh, you know, I mean, to be honest, I, I don't really see why you need both programs. Um, they are they're not entirely duplicative, but there's a lot of similarities to them. And it is um, harder than I think everyone expected to harmonize those two programs. The manufacturers have done a good job explaining uh, where the differences are and, and trying to raise the profile there. Uh, and, and they are based on two very, very different statutes that have different purposes. Uh, the DOT statute is about energy and the need uh, and is driven by the America's need to quote unquote conserve energy. Uh, you could argue that, you know, and the DOT may argue that since the U.S. has, uh, you know, had a, a fairly big unexpected boom uh, in fossil fuel, uh, with fracking and with uh, oil these days, that, that maybe the need to conserve has declined. As John DiCicco mentioned uh, in the 80s, there was actually a relaxation of the fuel economy standards uh, when global oil prices dropped. And so it was deter determined that the need for America to conserve energy was diminished. Um, uh, and, and yet on the other side, you have the greenhouse gas emission standards driven by environment, driven by climate change. Uh, and those uh, demands, the rationale uh, for that is only uh, increasing over time as the effects of climate change are becoming uh, more prominent uh, and the models continue to show that they are being overly conservative about the pace of climate. Uh, so there is a there's an uncomfortable marriage, I think, between those two statutes. Um, and uh, I can see why it would be useful uh, at some point to choose one uh, rather than try to keep both alive, but it would take an action in Congress uh, because they are uh, both, uh, the agencies are both driven by their statutory requirements. Thank you. And jump in with a quick thought on that, if you don't mind. I, I wrote, I've written a paper on this a few years ago. This is John speaking. Um, and, I'll, and I'll be, uh, I completely agree with what Drew said. And let me preface my remarks that, uh, Currently, you know, in the federal context, uh, I believe this is a bad time to try to make good policy. But ideally, going forward, I think the greenhouse gas standards uh, are the way, to, way to go. That is the urgent and growing need um, going forward. Um, I, I'll venture so much as to say that the CAFE standards are somewhat of an anachronism um, right now. Also, um, the Clean Air Act uh, is a much better tool uh, administratively for ensuring a progress. Uh, CAFE is, is a much uh, shakier tool administratively. When the standards were strengthened under Bush, the auto industry inserted uh, what I consider a poison pill, which is this five-year break. That was not in the original 1975 uh, Energy Policy and Conservation Act version of the standards, which also you know, didn't, didn't put a timetable on. But when you're setting standards for technology, you need lead time. You typically need 10 or more years of lead time to set a good standard. 
Uh, and the fact that that was not specified was abused for many years uh, when uh, the administration in charge uh, always waited till the last minute to promulgate CAFE standards and then, oops, there was not enough time to uh, allow the car companies to put technology in. And we're seeing a bit of that again as part of the midterm deal review. I mean, that's kind of partly enforced by the fact that automakers inserted this five-year limit on the CAFE standards. So, but, you know, we're stuck with what we have. Um, it would, as Drew said, take congressional action but I think going forward, the country and certainly the environment will be best served by letting CAFE standards, you know, taking them off the books and then moving forward with greenhouse gas uh, standards. Thank you. That's a um, really good perspective there. And I actually wanted to ask kind of a similar question to Jared. So as you mentioned with the Transportation and Climate Initiative, there are some conversations about a market-based mechanism like cap and invest. If something like that were achieved, do you think then the federal greenhouse gas emission standards and the fuel economy standards, the need for those would be obviated, or do you think they could be complementary? Uh, absolutely, they they would be complementary, and and really for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the 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 cafe standards or the greenhouse gas emission standards, which which you know I tend to agree with with John and Drew that that, that those are more important. Um, those those drive technology change, and um, you know we we see the same thing in the energy sector, where you know at the same time as we've had the Reggie program in place, which caps and reduces greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector. We've been supporting the technology with with um, mandates for energy efficiency and renewable energy, like New York's mandate of 50% renewable energy by 2030. Um, so it, it helps drive emission standards um, and and technology standards help drive the um, technology development that allows the industry to meet and comply with a a, a market based program at a lower cost. And and that's also, you know, you see that lesson in, in California where they have um, the emission standards, they have the zero emission vehicle mandate, and they have a cap and trade program that covers the transportation sector. And they, they just serve different roles in supporting the, the same overall goal of reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. That's a, a nice way to think about how these programs could work together. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the market for these cars. So this question is for Drew. You know, earlier we heard John mention that the sales of EVs are lagging. And I'm just curious, you know, as you've been looking at the data, have you also been seeing that as well? Well, it's it's a, it's a great question and an interesting one. Um, just to, um, I guess, review the numbers, uh, what we are seeing globally uh, is that uh, most of the sales of electric vehicles coming out um, are, are mainly focused uh, on, on major cities. Uh, we see that China, we see that in Europe, we see that in the United States where those are the big markets. Um, but where you do have policy, uh, you know, you do, we are seeing a lot of electric vehicles being driven into the fleet. Um, in in uh, California, for example, we're up to 5% of new vehicle sales. Um, in some major cities uh, in Europe, um, we're at you know, more than 20% vehicle sales, for example, in, um, in Oslo, Norway, and in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, so uh, I, I think the point that I would make here is that um, you know, EV sales are, are largely, if not entirely, driven by policy. Uh, and, and policy broadly, both the, the, you know, California's got the ZEV mandate, uh, they've had that for a number of years. Jared nicely mentioned that in his talk. Uh, other states have adopted it. Uh, that's a very strong driver. Uh, China has recently adopted their own version of a ZEV mandate uh, incorporated into their uh, fuel economy standards, which will require um, our expectation about 4% uh, EV sales in China uh, nationwide by 2020, so uh, really just around the corner. Um, and Europe, in a proposal on light-duty vehicles, has incorporated kind of a softer version of a ZEV mandate. It's a, 
it, they call it a benchmark. Um, it's 15% <clears throat> uh, by uh, 2025 of EVs, um, but it's uh, there's no penalty if you don't meet it. But there's a benefit in terms of relaxing the with their CO2 standards if you if you do meet it. Uh, and so a lot of the world is is focusing now on shifting from uh, I think recognizing that the fiscal policy is an incentive, which Jared nicely mentioned in his slide deck. Um, once you get into some significant levels of EV sales, uh, it's harder and harder for the taxpayers to foot the bill for those subsidies, um, and you're needed going to replace them with other policies that are equally, uh, you know, strong if you're going to continue this growth. So. Uh, you know, I, we continue to see pretty strong growth, uh, particularly in those areas that have policies. Uh, and the biggest worry from our perspective, frankly, is that um, as numbers of EVs continue to grow, as they, they have been um, transitioning from a fiscal driver to a non-fiscal driver or continuing those fiscal drivers, if you can, um, is, is a big important moment. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and if I can just weigh in a couple of points on that. Um, we've seen sales go up um, significantly. I believe it's 60% since um, we added the, the consumer incentive last spring, the $2,000 a vehicle for electric vehicles. So, um, you know, those complementary policies help a lot. The price of electric vehicles, the price difference is declining. And, and so those incentives will not be needed forever. And what is really important is building out the electric vehicle infrastructure to enable consumers to take advantage of the, the really the, the, the economic benefits of, of lower prices, not paying for gasoline, and, and having the comfort then that they can have places to charge their vehicles, whether they're on the road or they live in an apartment building or need to charge at a workplace, all of those are important parts of building the interest, sustained interest in electric vehicles. Okay, great. And um, John, I really appreciated that historical overview that you gave of you know how these standards came about and one question from the audience is that there was a, a perception that the Obama administration actually aligned the tailpipe, the tailpipe standard on the federal level with California. Is that not true? Was it the opposite? Um, I, I think that that's uh, largely accurate. I mean, there, these standards are pretty complex, uh, you know, some of which Drew alluded to. Uh, there are significant layers of flexibility in the federal program that was put together under the Obama administration uh, that were not in California's original program. So um, in terms of, shall we say, the broad you know, level of targets over you know, uh, what was in, envisioned when it was put together as a, you know, say, when a second round was finalized in 2012, targeting uh, 2025, roughly sort of a dozen year type program. Uh, the broad nominal, and I use the word nominal because it depends on many factors, levels of stringency were um, similar to those uh, envisioned under uh, California's program. But I, I think it's really important to emphasize that the, the program that ended up getting negotiated, the joint program, uh, has a great deal of additional flexibility in there in terms of uh, credits, in terms of, in particular, the um, weaker uh, truck standards in the near term, which, again, the hope was that the last round, the, the round now being debated, the 21 to 25 standards would help trucks catch up. Now, of course, that's being called into question. Um, you know, the original Pavley standards did not have the footprint adjustment in them. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of stringency, the reality is, is very different and not nearly as stringent as what California was on track to pursue on its own. Okay, thank you. That's helpful context to understand how we got here. Um, Jared, I had a question for you. Someone in the audience was actually curious about learning more about the Transportation and Climate Initiative listening sessions. You know, are there going to be workshops and who can go to these? 
Um, they the the one in New York that we held in a month ago was open to anyone that wanted to attend. Um, and 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 I believe that is the plan for the other ones, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, we we're starting with listening sessions. We we may move on to somewhat more targeted workshops. Um, and in the past, to 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 get us to this place, we've held a number of symposiums and workshops where we've um, sort of uh, uh, obtained more expert input um and and done some some uh analysis um along the way but we felt it important to to really hear from the public about how to to develop a program that would have a high degree of public acceptance um so uh i i believe there will be a few more other than the ones i i put on that slide but um none have been scheduled yet Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we can help get the word out about those listening sessions by uh, emailing the folks who registered for this webinar. Um, I also had a question for Drew. So when do we expect that California will next need to receive a federal waiver for its program, and what's going to happen if the administration rejects it? Uh, that is a very timely question. Um, so uh, a, a couple things to just point out. Uh, the first is that California has uh, an existing waiver uh, for its uh, for all of its programs, so it doesn't need to seek a waiver from the administration at this point. Um, the second is that the administration may, as, as mentioned, I think previously, that it may try to revoke the California waiver. Um, that is uh, markedly different than what has ever happened before. Um, in my slides, I had mentioned that there had been a denial of a waiver request, but that's different than revoking a waiver that has been granted and is already being acted upon for many years now. Right? Um, so, uh, and I guess the final point I would make is that, uh, you know, if California does decide to change its standards for whatever reason, um, uh, it would not have to seek a waiver until it wants to enforce those standards. Um, so it is possible, for example, for California to modify its standards at any time. Um, let's say it wants to make the standards more stringent starting in 2022, hypothetically, uh, it would not have to seek a waiver uh, until 2021 is the latest, for example. Um, so California ha does have a lot of flexibility as to um, when it promulgates regulations, but then the timing of seeking a waiver is something that California is, has some flexibility on. Okay, and sort of a follow-up question about California. If the federal standards are rolled back, could other states continue to adopt the California standards? This is a Jared. I'll, I'll answer that um, absolutely. And and you know the the states that have the standards on their books already, um, just like California, those standards are in place now, and they can implement the standards. Um, because California has a waiver already, as well, other states can adopt those standards regardless of what the federal government does. Thank you. That's helpful. So a question for John, you had mentioned about, you know, the importance of marketing these, uh, you know, cars that are more fuel efficient, talking about the climate benefits. As you've been tracking this issue, have you observed any increasing interest on the part of the car manufacturers in marketing EVs and making clear that these models are available? Well, uh, yes, I think. Uh, you know the automakers are responding to the policy in, the, in that regard, as as you know, uh, Drew pointed out, it's a very policy-driven phenomenon on the electric vehicle side. Um, you know they want the incentives, they they want that extra cash to help them um, get the electric uh, vehicles out there. Uh, they've all announced plans to put more electrics. Uh, into their fleets, some you know very ambitious uh, sounding plans. Although you know, kind of when you look at the fine print, they're often more aspirational than firm uh, in that regard. Um, 
you know, the reality is, is that electrics are still a tough sell at the volumes that have been hoped for by regulators, you know, in California and were, um, you know, goals were articulated early in the Obama administration. Uh, I forget, you know, what the number, you know, year was, but I think, you know, a million electric vehicles on the road by 2015. And, um, you know, many of these very aspirational targets have, well, they've all proven to be very difficult in spite of very substantial incentive uh, support, uh, very uh, substantial um, marketing support. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the costs on electrics are falling, but they still have a long way to go. Uh, it's going to be a very long time before costs and capabilities of the technology uh, are going to make them viable for um, the most popular segments in the market, you know, SUVs and pickups. I mean, there will be offerings that have some plug-in vehicles in those categories, but I think we can expect those volumes to be minuscule. I, w I won't mince, mince words on that. They're just not feasible, you know, at the million scale sales levels of some of the most popular platforms. And, and you know, and that's that's why I took pains to them emphasize that we, uh, as important uh, as electrics may be for long-term goals, um, you know, we need to make progress. We need to cut carbon sooner rather than later, and we need to do it in the high volume segments. And so uh, it's, uh, it's really an and proposition. Uh, yes, um, it's, you know, we have programs to promote electrics. Uh, sales have been increasing, but the volumes are still really in the statistical noise as far as carbon is concerned. And, and, I, and I say that literally, having done the numbers. <laughs> uh, and uh, so in addition to uh, what's being done on, on that score, looking at a very long-term horizon, if we want to get on track in terms of carbon cutting over the next five years, 10 years, and even 20 years, we're going to have to pay much more attention to shifting market preferences in, in the mainstream internal combustion uh, segments. Yeah, actually, John, let me ask you a follow-up question there. So um, would you mind elaborating a little bit about um, how we could do more to harness that emotional element of car buying to help try to achieve these changes? Well, well, sure. You know, um, we pretty much have to start from square zero, though. I mean, I, I mean, it needs to be researched and developed. Yep. You know, electric vehicles now benefit from 28 years and counting, or 27 years and counting. Uh, the original ZEV mandate was established in California in um, 1990. It targeted 10% of the California market to be electric, all electric, you know, not hybrids, not, you know, uh, but all electric or, or fuel cell. Uh, and that original 10% target was supposed to have been uh, in 2003, uh, 15 years ago. Um, and enormous market research, consumer education, as well as incentives, as well as regulatory support, has gone in to trying to sell electric cars. That's great. It's an important technology. It, it, it clearly much cleaner than internal combustion. Um, but we have not made any comparable effort uh, to try to connect the dots for consumers across the mainstream market. We've left it to the whims of fuel prices. So I don't have a formula for that. I don't have a program. Basically, my point is that uh, there's a lot of white space there uh, that, uh, you know, needs to be filled in. Uh, I, I don't think that that has even been embraced as a need by either the auto industry or government policymakers, or for that matter, the environmental community, which drives, you know, a lot of the policy uh, in this arena. So uh, here we are, um, you know, looking at this major disconnect, um, I, I think we need to roll up our sleeves uh, and, and get to work on figuring out how to do that 
Uh, because the car is such an emotional product, I don't think it's impossible. And, you know, it's not a matter of shifting like 100% of consumers. You're not going to do that. It's going to vary. What motivates is going to vary by segment, by demographic, and so on. And all of that has to be figured out. But I think that's a tractable uh, thing to do. Uh, I think we, we are at square zero, though, pretty much on that uh, as a society. Yeah, and actually just, you know, random anecdote, I actually have driven a Volt, um, and, you know, there's ways, I think, to focus on some of the other benefits of electric technology, like it's a much quieter, smoother ride, it accelerates pretty quickly, so certainly there's a lot of work that can be done there. Let me actually turn to Jared and talk about the impacts um, in New York. So, you know, number one, we can talk about the co-benefits of reducing air pollution, but we had a specific question about you know, how the retirement of the travel provision has affected auto dealerships in New York, um, if at all? Um, so I, I'm not sure I have a, a clear answer to that question, other than that we're working with dealers on, um, on strategies to build interest in electric vehicles. And, and the mandate, excuse me, the, the incentive that we provided um, $2,000 a vehicle has has built significant interest in in buying electric vehicles. So so you know dealers are are have and and dealers worked with us in developing the approach that we use, which is is basically the consumer gets that money when they buy the car. Um, it's not like the federal program where you get a tax incentive after the fact. So um, dealers. Dealers are 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 happy with with that program, and that's helping them sell the electric vehicles. There's also a key role for the manufacturers to be um, to be marketing the vehicles. And 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 you know, going back to the previous question, um, I I think we are seeing more of that. I've just been watching the NBA playoffs the last last week or two, and and I think the most advertised car I've seen has been the Nissan Leaf. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, and we're, we're seeing the manufacturers starting to, to, you know, emphasize advertising of these vehicles a little bit more. Um, and, and to your point, Fatima, they are, they are fun cars to drive. And I do think we're going to meet a point when, um, you know, when, 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 when more and more people have them, they're talking to their neighbors. Um, you know, my son would tell all of his friends that he would much rather drive his, you know, my 17 year old son, much rather drive my electric car than, than another car because of the pep it has, the acceleration. And, and so, you know, I think all those things are going to help us, um, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, you know, achieve, get where we need to go on electric vehicles. Public health impacts are really important that, that you mentioned. And, it, and it's not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing NOx emissions that contribute to ozone levels, um, emissions of toxic pollutants that come from uh, gasoline to the extent we're plugging into the grid, significant reductions in toxic emissions, which are going to, you know, have, have, significant public health benefits for for our residents. Thank you. And I think that's actually a great note to end on. So I just wanted to thank our panelists for joining us. This is a great conversation. For everyone who dialed in, we are going to be posting the recording of this webinar on our YouTube page, which you can link to from our website. And uh, we thank everyone again for making time for this discussion, and we hope to continue the conversation offline. So thank you again, and hope you all have a great afternoon.